As abortion takes center stage in many campaign races, data shows that in Virginia, abortions have increased by at least 60 percent, despite the Supreme Court Dobbs ruling. What does it all mean? Plus, our legal counsel is defending the Suffolk City mom who was banned from praying out loud during her public comments at the school board meeting. We've got these updates and more. Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, with our president, Victoria Cobb. Greetings, friends. This is Jesse Blakely, the audio producer for Speak Up Virginia. I just wanted to quickly note that this episode was recorded before we had an opportunity to respond to the horrific attacks and human rights violations that occurred in Israel. We know that you are joining us in prayer for those grieving the loss of loved ones and for those currently missing or being held hostage. We also pray for God's mercy worldwide and for the wisdom of our nation's leaders as the ramifications of this attack unfold. And with that said, we'll return to our regular programming. Well, welcome, everybody. Glad to have you back again for Speak Up Virginia. And I also want to welcome back Victoria. We missed you the last couple of episodes while you were traveling around the state doing your various, you know, <laughs> speaking events and different things. So glad to have you back. Glad to be back. Well, Victoria, since you've been gone for a while, I did want to ask you about something fun. It's, it's, well, it depends on your perspective, whether it's fun or scary. But what's been in the news lately is still AI. AI continues to be a hot topic. It's shaking up the tech world. It is, you know, investors are talking about it. And so it's been very interesting to watch it continue to be at the top of the news. But it's also invading our personal lives. We're starting to feel that effect. Tell us what you've experienced. Well, you know, there's a bunch of things lately that AI has crept into for us um, in our family. Uh, I'll mention one, which is uh, my my 12 year old braces apparently are now controlled by AI. Who knew? Um, you know, so my kid now totally different than when we were kids. You know, you get the metal things on and whatever. Well, apparently. She literally is now every week, she has to put her phone and it, there's an app and it does a scan. Long story short, every week, scans get sent from her mouth to, and they said literally AI checks it for hygiene issues, any brackets that are broken or whatever. And then the dentist finds out later, like after the AI has done its thing and it'll let you know what it needs to, whether you need to come in or not. So that was entertaining. That is amazing. I, I, <laughs> is there something technology? So yes, literally yeah, it's an app. Mouth? Yeah, so there's like a piece and your phone attaches and you literally like follow, you know how on a camera you follow like a, if you take a um, panoramic and you follow a line, she's literally taught how to like, you know, in front of a mirror with a phone, scan her teeth so that AI can handle the rest. I'm like, it's pretty soon. Does the dentist, like, is the dentist still needed? Like, at some point, do we just turn it all over to AI? Well, but then, go ahead. Do our dentist expenses reduce because we don't have to have those well, huge that, machines? Well, it doesn't feel like, I will just tell you from the bill that we're getting on this one, it doesn't feel any cheaper than okay. when my older daughter did it with less technology. So I don't know. But the other one that's weird is politics. So yeah. AI is entering politics, which I think is insane. So I, I never thought about this, but our opposition research this year seems a little bit like a touch up than it's ever been. They seem to be finding more things on candidates. Yeah. And one of the things I found out about, which maybe everybody's known this, I may be slow to the, the game, but literally they can now, there's a website where people can scan a picture of someone. So a current picture of you, for example, and I put it in this website. Don't give me as an example. I, no, <laughs> and it scans <laughs> and AI sort of remembers, like it can kind of tell what you would have looked like 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, let's or, not do me. Yeah, so literally, okay, we'll do me. So it can go back and it can find every picture picture on the internet that's ever been posted dark web or regular and it can pull what I mean because you know I mean if you're doing it manually to find what someone looked like 20 years ago it might be yeah. difficult but if AI is stepping in and creating what you would have looked like and knows then unfortunately that means hey kids whatever you're doing now 20 30 40 yeah. years from now be ready because anything you put on that web can be pulled by AI yeah so I'll just mention one thing I thought was kind of fun. You know, these tech companies are continually trying to stay ahead of the game, one up each other. And so now you've got Meta that, of course, controls Facebook and Instagram and all of those platforms. They're trying to get a step ahead. So they've introduced these AI characters. Like the avatar that... I, I, I don't know how all it works. All I know is that I can talk with Jane Austen instead of like doing a boring search thing like <laughs> chat GPT, you know, where it's search and it's intelligent you can actually interact with a character while you're trying to do your research. And so they have things like Jane Austen. Um, I think they have Tom Brady who was willing to 
um, donate his characteristics apparently for a fun wow. character. So you can, you can talk with these people. Um, I was kind of tempted by the Jane Austen one personally. Yeah. I mean, I just sit there and think, and this is gonna make me sound really old, but I just sit there and think, man, my kids get all the books they're supposed to read, both in print and they can just listen to them. And now apparently they could have the characters. So anyway, I they don't even talk know. To Shakespeare. I mean, it might have helped me a little. I mean, you know, yeah, because I never understood all the words in all those books. But anyway. Well, back to what I was saying about it kind of starting to invade our lives, you know, depending on how you look at it. I was in the grocery store the other day and we're just going to flash this on the screen for our YouTube viewers. I saw this grocery store display that I took a picture of and it says it was advertising AI co-created Coke Zero. Now, I will mention that it's on sale, as you can see from our picture, two for $4. Does so that mean no one's buying it because we're all scared? I okay. don't know, but I was suckered into this. I did buy a couple okay. because n for those of you that know Victoria personally, <laughs> You know that she is a Coke Zero aficionado. That's that's, <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. <laughs> it's you, my vice. We could say addict. Addict that would, be, would probably be. <laughs> all I know is since I've been here at Family Foundation, <laughs> if Victoria is here, there is always there is going to be a Coke Zero yes. like five inches from her hand. That's true. <laughs> so confessions, public confessions. She is the Coke Zero expert. <laughs> now I don't want to set this up too much unfairly, right. but we are going to give you a little taste test. All right. Um, <laughs> I want to see if Victoria, having been a Coke Zero aficionado for so many years, can tell the difference with the AI version. And I did look to see if the ingredients were different. <laughs> I'll tell, I'll oh, tell that's you funny. I, yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm going to participate in this competition. Okay. And to administer this taste test, we have a special guest today. Our Vice President of Policy and Government Relations, Dr. Todd Yaki. I don't know if you can get your face in here, but at least wave your hand or something. I can, I can wave my hand <laughs> the camera. Yeah. Now, usually you will see Todd doing much more serious, sober topics, doing videos on policy, going up to our Capitol and testifying. But we talked him into doing this this fun, yeah. have some fun with us, do a trivial taste test. Well, I think this is serious, right? This okay. is this is this serious is research right here. It could revolutionize right my d addiction. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, all right. We are going to let you take over, Todd. Tell okay. us what to do here. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you a tray. It's going to have four cups. Okay. Uh, two are numbered number one, and then two are numbered number two. And you're going to take a taste of each one, and I'm going to tell you when to taste from each cup. Okay. And then you're going to guess, and we're going to do a, have a reveal after you have, All after right. you think you know which is which. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so our I, goal is to determine which one's which, not which one we like better. Which one is which? Okay, where yeah. the real Coke if Zero is hiding. Victoria Cod knows the real Coke Zero. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know. I don't All know right. if they can see this on camera, but Wait. I'm going to I'm going to tell you which All one right. to choose. Okay. Okay. And you're you're going to start off. Candy, you're going to drink from this one. You want me to go okay. first, or yeah. are we going at the you, same time? You can go at the same time, and then oh, that's you this one from that All one. All right, we're taking we're... the test here. Cheers, no toast. Oh, <laughs> cheers! <laughs> you got to swash it around, kind of get the I flavor in your sip. mouth. I think I know. <laughs> you, don't say anything. I, I feel the same way. Don't say anything. All right. Okay. All right. Now? No, wait, how do we cleanse our palate? <laughs> Just kidding. That is such a good point. <laughs> Fair I mean, question. You know, you've got leftover. Uh, Fair right? question. Okay. okay. That's all right. All right. So now, Candy, you're going to choose uh, cup number two, and then Victoria, cup number two over there. All right. Yeah, I think I, I know. I feel 100% certain. It's going to be embarrassing if we're wrong. <laughs> what if we both feel strongly that I we're not the same one? <laughs> All right. This might show we're both addicts. Like, All right. Do you think you know? I do. I, I think yeah. we know. Do you want to tell us? I mean, do you want us Wait, to tell you? Wait, you've got to do the review. Right, oh, okay. You're going to say. All right. You're going to say which one, and okay. then I'm going to lift the cardboard covering off of the drinks, and we'll okay. see if you're right or not. All right. Victoria, you go first. All right. I think the first one was the AI one, and the second one was the zero. Is I'm that what you think? I'm in complete agreement. Okay. I knew immediately. All right. All right. We're and you're very why, confident. I that's think I'm, why it's on sale for two for four dollars. Okay. It tastes. It does not compare. <laughs> quite different. All right. Not quite different, but different. Let's see if you're right. Uh, which ones? Is this one and this is two? Because we don't see one, the numbers. Okay. One and two. All right. That one better be the AI one. I'm, Yes, okay. Yeah. We were yeah. we were okay. Congratulations. Good. I don't think you, we really helped Coke Zero sell this new product. Sorry. Well. But, <laughs> but I think that the moral of the story is you were not duped by AI. We were not you, duped. You so maybe figured we're gonna it out. farewell in the I next think the yes. scary era. part of the story is that AI did not improve this product. 
Also that's a, true. That's a fair. Yeah. That's All right, a fair I need to ask one well. question. It would be really great though if the AI Coke Zero did not have aspartame. It does. Be- both darn, because that's the problem with my addiction a- is I'm rotting my brain or something I'm like that. I'm pretty sure I saw that AI Coke Zero has 20 at least. I, I could I could try to adapt if it didn't if it wasn't, but it tastes pretty bad. It has I'm a lot more it. sodium. Oh yeah, I don't want that either. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to get a letter from Coke. I just need a healthy Coke Zero. <laughs> Why isn't there a healthy Coke Zero? I don't, anyway. All right. Well, that was. Um, that concludes our <laughs> thank you, Todd. Thank you, Todd, You're for helping us out. Thank you for letting me be part of this. <laughs> yes. We look forward to having you on later for more serious policy talks. Sounds, sounds great. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to change this out for water. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. <laughs> don't need the extra sodium today. And I'll keep mine. Uh, <laughs> All right. Shifting gears here. We're getting serious. Um you don't look serious yet. But <laughs> I'm we're serious. Gonna, I got my serious face on. Got our serious faces on. Really, though, there is some very important news on the abortion front that we need to talk about and dissect. Um, but before we go right into that, Victoria, I just couldn't resist getting your take on this chaos going on in the U.S. Congress right now. I mean, you've got people you know, throwing down fire alarms right before a key vote. You've got a few Republicans ousting the House Speaker. First time that's been done in history. What is going on? Yeah, it's kind of a mess. So I got to I got to address the fire alarm thing first, because this excuse that somehow this guy didn't know what he was doing is unbelievable. He was a principal. Once I heard that, guess what happens in public schools? I don't know where he was. You know any how school. the fire alarm works. You know how the fire alarm works and you know the kids pull it for an excuse to get out of class. So that is absurd. So uh, we'll just set that aside. I cannot believe. And actually, there, the fact that there's no penalty so far for this I, is, is troubling. But anyway, all right. And then the House Speaker thing, um, I would just say this. OK, first of all, the Speaker wasn't super popular to begin with, right? So he barely got in in the first place. If you remember, we had a whole lot of votes over Speaker yeah. at the front of this Congress. Um, and, you know, he broke his promise. So this is what a lot of times in politics, you can break promises to people all the time and get away with it. And in this case, there were eight Republicans that said, look, you promised to pass 12 spending bills that were separate, that weren't continuing resolutions. He you know, apparently did four and then made a deal with the Democrats. And so, I mean, to some degree, we do want to see some accountability in our leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I appreciate the concept of what the eight did, although here's the important thing. The average American person doesn't care. The voter is not going to, I mean, they kind of have a low view of Congress anyway. And it's kind of like, okay, I don't know who the best out of all you terrible people are. I mean, that's the general view of the public. And so the Democrats are salivating over this fight. And I honestly don't think it'll amount to much. I don't think it'll matter. I think a lot of people might wonder if we weren't going to get things through the Senate anyway, why did we just... Do all this? Do all this. It's a great question. I mean, it's a fair question. And I think we know, Congress, things go slowly and they don't go as planned. And, I, you know, I, it's a challenge. But uh, I think what they need to do right now is figure out how do you bring these coalitions within the Republican um, you know, caucus? How do you bring them together? How do you bring the eight that said enough is enough together back with the, the you know, pe- ones that people would call establishment that aren't as conservative, aren't as strong, you know, so you got to find a leader that's willing to lead all that. I don't know who wants that job. Do I think anyone no, thank can you. do that at this point. I, I hope so, because now, it's going to be. I saw that in the news. <laughs> well, no, what was even funnier is there were people who kind of don't want to see the scenario where Trump and Biden are our choices. And they were like, Trump, only you can save this house because they would rather him be speaker than end up in a, in a presidential situation where we have to choose between him and Biden. So that's actually very entertaining. Thank you for those that are, yeah. you know, like trying to, you know, sort of throw a <laughs> throw something into the middle of a crazy election season. Yeah. But um, and people don't realize, like, apparently you I, this came up before, but like you can be speaker of the house and not be in a elected congressman, which I think most people, that would not happen at a state level, but apparently it could happen at the federal level. So that's yes. weird. Um, we're not bored from one day to the next. No, no. But, we can be entertained um, by it, but I don't yeah. think it will substantially change the nature of how people view Congress. Yeah, that's the sub. <laughs> if part. they had a high rating, well, sure, but nobody yeah. thinks of them very well now anyway. All right. Well, I'm just going to throw out there in the middle of all this chaos, we also had this news of the passing of a Democrat senator, Diane Feinstein, Now, she was kind of an institution. She was the oldest sitting senator, been there for more than 30 years. You know, she was definitely an institution on the left and in California. Um, But now we've got this crazy situation with California Governor Gavin Newsom appointing this person. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, we knew the choice of someone like Gavin Newsom wasn't going to be a choice we would make. But I think he kind of... um, hit the the old time high for a liberal, you know, find the most um, kind of crazy appointment possible, I would say. I mean, I don't know this individual, but um, just the profile. And I think 
really the thing is um, he basically said let me find the biggest abortion rights person I can find and so this woman you know had been her name is LaFonza Butler and Basically, the first thing and main thing you need to know about her is she was the president of Emily's List. So if you're unfamiliar with Emily's List, that is the pack on the abortion side that puts all the money behind candidates to push an extreme abortion agenda. So he went out and kind of took that person and said, OK, now we'll throw you in the U.S. Senate so you can drive your agenda there. And here's the part that I think most I think even even people who might agree with abortion and might not be as bothered as I am that she came off of Emily's List would be kind of bothered by this. She's not a Californian. She lives in Maryland. I mean, that to me is crazy. But again, you never know with this kind of Yeah, I I guess apparently there was some statements that maybe she was going to change her residence after this appointment. But it's that's a little crazy. That's where you look at that and go, okay, what was the priority here? Wasn't representing Californians. Yeah. Um, Now, he's claiming she had a past in California, but she's living in, I believe, Maryland at the time of this appointment and voting in Maryland. It's amazing Um, that he's brazen enough to do that. Yeah. Clearly, as you said, abortion was the priority. And I I think it's noteworthy that her entire career was dedicated to pushing abortion across the country as president of this group. Yeah, that used to be sort of a, you know... I mean, honestly, a true activist used to not be a good candidate for Senate or Congress. Like, they didn't usually pick the most extreme on one issue because, you know, it was very obvious that you weren't going to come in and try to, you know, compromise or be pragmatic or or move the ball forward because they were you were so far on one extreme but i guess we've that that, i mean that is that's not this is not the first time somebody's you know been more extreme on an issue but it's just clearly we're heading in a a different direction where we're kind of symbolically saying Yeah. yeah this is this one thing is that important all right the other thing that is being promoted out there about this candidate is that she is also being touted as the first openly gay or lesbian senator from california So this is identity politics at its height. We're not looking at, as you said, representing the people in her area. We are looking at identity politics. And there's this whole philosophy of what they call intersectionality. I was just going to say, she wins the intersectionality (laughs) game. She was the top, you know, person that represented every single kind of class. She checks all the boxes. All the boxes. Woman, abortion advocate, a black woman, gay. I mean... It checks all the points, but the thing that's disturbing about it is we are seeing kind of this state-enforced ideology of identity politics, which means your value is based on whether you belong to these categories that are, have this perception of having the most oppression, and that's what your value is based on. If I were elected, you know, if I were appointed, I guess in this case, to the U.S. Senate, I would know, I would want to think that it's about how smart I am, how competent I am, how not the color of my skin, the status of what sexuality I have. Do you know what I'm it's saying? Like to me, demeaning. it feels demeaning. Yes. It feels demeaning to her because well, what that's what the, the articles are about. And then, yeah, the does voters. She, does I mean, does she know about my community if right. I'm a voter? Uh, yeah. Well, if she's not this in is... California, I would say at least not recently. She doesn't know yeah, about your not community. Recently. Yeah. So yeah, incredibly disappointing. All right. Well, going back to the part, looking at the advocacy, the hardcore advocacy of abortion, what I wanted to really kind of underscore with you, Victoria, was how that does translate into loss of human life, uh, human babies in the womb. Because we talk a lot about, well, people did this, they advocate for that. But it has impact on human life. And one thing I think that really reveals that is, and we hadn't had a chance to talk about this, and so I wanted to bring this to you because yeah. I know you have some really good viewpoints, some perspective on this, and that are these um, these statistics coming out of the Guttmacher Institute that clearly shows this reality, this impact. So it looks like, just to kind of set this up, um, it looks like starting in 2020, after years of an actual decline in abortion numbers, we started seeing this uptick you know, at, um, despite the overturning of Roe v. Wade, we are still seeing this increase. And specifically here in Virginia, it looks like data is showing at least a 60 percent increase from if you I think they were comparing it to uh, the first part of 2020 and then looking at the first half of 2023, 60 percent increase. Why is that happening? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to go go back a little bit to right before 2020, and we need to understand what had happened in Virginia. So over a period of years, we had passed some really important incremental policies that would protect human life. So things like, are there going to be safety standards in abortion facilities? And why that's important is because it's unfortunate, but it tends to be the case that the abortion industry, rather than spending money to make sure women are safe, 
even if unborn children aren't, um, they tend to shut down. And so we had had closures of clinics as a result of that. Um, we had a bill that was a window to the womb bill that just simply says a woman has a right to her own medical diagnostic test, which is to see her ultrasound. So if she's going to think about an abortion, let's at least let her see what, she, you know, so she takes the decision with all of its information. So we had had these really important things. And those laws, from the point at which we had all those incremental laws put in, over the course of five years, we had had a 40% abortion reduction. So really big deal. The whole country was going down slightly. Virginia was really How dropping. How many lives do you estimate that is? Yeah, so we, we looked at what the difference is, and we believe it saved over 16,000 lives during that time period. So and we, and we talk about this because it's important people understand, even if you can't yeah. get the most pro-life law, and right. you know, if you're getting something, you're saving lives each year, right? right. So that was a big deal. And also that... A, you know, we shouldn't deal with this because it's politics. No, these laws resulted in 16,000 16, lives saved. Lives. It's, it's, a big, it's about lives. It's a big deal. So then, of course, get to, you know, right before um, well, 2020, so that session, we then have a liberal House, liberal Senate, and the governor we all love who said... Let's just keep the baby comfortable after it's born and then make a decision, right? We all remember that moment with Governor Northam. So, yeah. so during that era, they wiped away all of those incremental laws. So with one bill, all of that comes off of our code. And so the abortion industry can run rampant and they can do whatever they want. And women don't get all the information. Mm -hmm. And that took effect July 1, 2020. So it's really relevant to this data because we said at the time, look, we know that this has made a significant difference in the decline. If you take all that away you're going to see an uptick. And unfortunately, we have. Now there's even more factors in mm -hmm. the uptick beyond that. But yeah. that was definitely the starting point because that's what changed at the point where we're starting yeah, to see these numbers bounce right back up. Quite a dramatic increase. Yeah, yeah thousands of more lives right. uh, being lost. So. And then, of course, you have the tourism abortion, which they're commenting mm -hmm. on in lots of articles. A lot of articles make it look like this is all about tourism abortion, but some of our neighboring states only recently actually banned abortion to the degree that they have. Mm -hmm. And so the abortion tourism doesn't start in 2020, right? It's post Dobbs. So it's, it's, but we don't, that's what's scary. We don't know how much that's going to compound an more. already yeah. difficult problem and then of course we have to talk about chemical abortion and how that plays into all this yeah i was going to ask you how much i wanted to hear do you think that's the majority part of this increase the chemical abortions <sighs> it's hard to say i would say this the chemical abortion message that is being given by planned parenthood is just take a pill it's a piece of cake don't worry about it it'll just it's like take an advil mm -hmm. that is how they're treating chemical abortion that is what so i think there are a number of women who don't have all the information, think this is the route to go. And so, and now it's sort of, you know, we have this era where it's been be, being given out basically with hardly mm -hmm. even a doctor because of the Biden regulations. We've talked yeah. about that before. But I mean, basically they haven't even had to kind of go through the steps of what a, you would with a surgical abortion. And so, yeah, I think there's, I think that's a big factor here. I actually do think it is a large part of the increase because it makes it easy for women to divorce the emotion of that decision, that action, at least in their mind, you know, divorce themselves from the reality that this is a human life in the womb. Because, you know, in your mind as a woman, you can take a pill. You can do it in the secrecy, the privacy of your home. You don't have to interact with other people about it. No one has to know. You don't even have to interact with a lot of, or if any, medical professionals. Um, so it just becomes something you're doing unilaterally and a pill feels pretty divorced from the reality of human life. Uh, but the reality is you are, you're not divorced from it because sadly, there is a real risk of complications. You are, even if there's not complications, you are going to feel some heartbreaking, um, the real outcomes of that, of, of a baby, a human life leaving your system. And when you're doing something like that, there are serious risks that are scary. And that's why this is frightening that women just don't even know about these complications. Tell us about this news headline. It's, it's heartbreaking. This young woman that really puts a human face to this. Yeah, I mean, um, gosh, just, just recently there was a news story of a woman out of the state of Nevada. She was 24 years old. So her whole life ahead of her, essentially. And she's a young mom mm -hmm. already. And her name is Ale Aliona Dixon. Sorry if I got that wrong. but um, And basically, she was prescribed the two-dose abortion, chemical abortion at a Planned Parenthood clinic. And according to the family attorney, she ends up, the cause of death is a septic abortion. It's from basically her body having an infection, reacting to the abortion, her not really being in medical care. And so she... 
unbelievably, I mean, it's just devastating because she leaves behind a one-year-old child. And this and, happened in less than a week. Yeah, it was a, a they week. They lost from, her less than a week. And her family basically said it happened so fast. They had no idea. They didn't get to say goodbye. I mean, it. Yeah. and that, that one-year-old now doesn't have a mom. And I mean, this is, you know, this is just a reality that I don't think is ever talked about as the abortion industry just keeps pushing this. And I think, you know, a lot of folks know Abby Johnson's story. It's another mm -hmm. example where she just talks about what it was really like to have a chemical abortion in the movie Unplanned. You can, mm -hmm. you, I mean, you literally, and even when there's not a complication like this, just the process is so much more than women are prepared for. And I, I just think that is is just tragic. Like anything else this serious, a doctor needs to be involved and they need to know that the, that this is this is really what they're doing. I mean, your body isn't intended to take the life of yeah. your unborn child. That's not how God made us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking this is getting buried. Th these women's faces are getting buried in the news coverage. It's getting covered up. Even with the federal requirements, the complications, we do not have sufficient requirements right now, correct, to report complications like this. Well, even even more than that, the news story that just came about about the woman who went to CVS and she was given the chemical abortion pill instead of a fertility drug. Wow. And it took the, like, literally, she's trying to get pregnant. They make a they make a, a fault, you know, they just make yeah. a mistake. But you just think about how do mistakes happen? Well, when they're outside, of, of a doctor oversight, I just sit there and think, we are taking human life. This can't be done like an Advil. It can't be done so, even like a prescription yeah. over-the-counter pill. It's it's in another category. Well, this 24-year-old who just lost her life, life. in less than a week, yep. had a one-year-old baby. I do think about the leftist campaigns saying, say her name. Yes. And yes. I think maybe because these just get shuffled you know, the media does the not want to talk about yeah, this no one's it messes talking up about their it. narrative. So I think maybe we need to have the same kind of dedication to these women that lost their lives. Maybe yep. we need yep. to start saying, say her say name. Her name. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to shift gears. That's a sobering topic. It's, it's a tragic thing that happened, but this is why we can't give up on this issue. Um, but I'm going to do another gear shift here. I did want to bring our audience up to speed on what is happening with the controversy over public prayer in Suffolk City with the school board. Our listeners might recall us talking about this brave mom, Angela Kilgore, who during her public comment, she was trying to ask for parental rights to be respected on the transgender issues in schools. But at the end of her comment, you may remember us talking about, she said, you know what, as a community, I just don't think we can get through this without prayer, so I'd like to say a prayer. And then she was promptly told by the school board chairman, nope, that's not allowed. We can't allow you to have a prayer. And she handled it very well. She just respectfully said, well, if anyone wants to uh, join me for prayer outside the school board meeting. But the audience said, no, no, this isn't right. And several members of the audience just stood up spontaneously and began saying the Lord's Prayer. And then the school board chair instructed the police to clear the room as if the prayer was equivalent to some right. kind of bomb threat or something. Um, so this has become national news. Now, I will say we were one of the first to break this news in our email alert on this podcast. And then our legal team ended up defending Angela Kilgore. And it has become national news after that. So we're going to show a few news headlines up here. Um but Victoria, tell us first of all what our Founding Freedoms Law Center is doing. Yeah, I mean, it's super exciting that our Founding Freedoms Law Center really just wanted to dive into this case. So they took up Angela's case and um, they basically joined with another organization, First Liberty, who does, people probably know them best for doing the Coach Kennedy case. Mm -hmm. So another prayer, another sort of prayer in a public place kind of case. And um, so together, our, this legal, uh, these two legal organizations sent a letter to the board and basically told them that their policy or their their and I wouldn't call it a policy because it was just a reaction of the chairman in the moment yeah. that their reaction is inappropriate and basically you know among other things the letter makes clear that a private person speaking during their public comment time is not an agent of the government they're not the government trying to force a religion on someone right so this is just a ridiculous idea yeah. that they tried to infer around the situation and it's just not true that that kind of a prayer someone's personal 
comment prayer that is not done by government official. It's just not true that that breaks some kind of yeah. constitutional principle or the establishment clause or, or something like that. No, so no one thinks Angela is speaking for the government. No, That's the bottom no, line. No Everyone th- understands. She's behind the microphone <laughs> yeah. opposite the government officials. It's pretty clear just yeah. by the room situation that she's not a government official. And so the letter just makes clear that we want the board to correct the situation and issue a statement saying that, you know, pr- prayer that they're, that, you know, is not, um, you know, not disallowed. So don't prohibit citizens from saying what they want to say having a religious expression yes. or even yeah just during their own comment time during That's their the own point. comment time this is their time so what i thought was interesting was the school board chair at the time actually raised this hypothetical situation where he said he's basically saying if we allow her to pray then you can have satanists Other religions come in, and he said, he made this statement, something about they might be wanting to slice a goat. He actually said this. And you got to ask, are you actually trying to say to us that if you allow Angela Kilgore to have the freedom to just say a quick prayer because she thinks it'll bring unity to the community, that someone then, you then have to allow goat sacrifice at your next meeting? Is that (laughs) Yeah, it it felt very much like he was just using a scare tactic, that he was just taking it to its most extreme situation to try to make everybody think that this prayer that she was going to say was super scary. I mean, that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, and even if he really thought that, which he could, It's just not true, um, which we're going to get into in a minute. Um, That's not a a valid legal opinion, but we're going to get more into that. But what I wanted to talk about was out of this whole thing with the news coverage happening, the local paper decided to give an opinion. And it was very interesting. I wanted to give Victoria a chance to respond to it. This is the Virginia Mercury. And the headline is, Kerfuffle over Christian prayer at board meeting is overblown. It was written by Mr. Roger Chelsea, who is described as a longtime columnist and an editorial writer for the paper. And in this piece, he claims that this whole thing is, quote, the latest example of some Christians complaining they're under siege in America. And he he uses to kind of back up his point that, well, Christians, according to statistics, are actually the majority religion in America. So, Victoria, let's just start with that. Yeah, there's so much I could say about this. And actually, maybe there's a a moment where we kind of do a whole nother talk about this. But let's start with, so his evidence for this is that 60% of America is Christian, right? So in order to get there, he has to take every single person that identifies as Catholic and every single person that identifies as a mainline Protestant denomination, all those people, put them together and act like they're all the same, which is not true because we know a lot of people claim a title of a faith, but don't actually try to express it anywhere, right? There are just tons of people that that's not, it's just, it's a very, it's either a very personal thing, but it's not, it's not a faith that they're Doing what the founders intended us to do, which is to exercise our religion in the public square. Or they say they are Christian, but they don't actually have a biblical worldview. Right, they're not actually, yeah, they're not a biblical worldview. They don't show up (laughs) at church, but they, you know, they hold to a title. So in order to get to his number, that that's the first thing that you have to know. But the second thing that I think is interesting is I actually just went to a fascinating talk by a Baylor professor who's doing research on Christianophobia. So we we hear about Islamophobia. That's a word we're comfortable with. We never heard of Christianophobia. Well, he's literally starting to do the research that people are actually have irrational fear around, and it's. He's using it around fundamental Christians, evangelists, people that are willing to actually, people that actually go to go to church every week and people who actually express their faith. And they he's literally asking them questions like, are you more or less likely to hire someone if you found out they were that type mm-hmm. of person? And guess what's coming back? We have a problem. And yes, I'm not going to call it under siege. I feel like he used the greatest, you know, he's trying to make it this extreme case. But I'm going to say this. There is a real bias starting to happen. And he gets in his research, and maybe we can talk about this some other time, but he literally gets statements out of these people like, yeah, they need to just worship in their own home. I mean, he gets them to basically say, we don't want them in the public square Mm -hmm. um, because they they feel that way. So there's a real problem. And this author acting like we're creating this situation and we're just trying to, to, you know, yell there's fire in the building is is not fair. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand how you cannot think there's a problem when you can clearly see Christians are quickly becoming the only people group that it is okay in this country to have bias against. How can you not see there's a problem when you have good Christian families being told they cannot adopt because of their biblical worldview? Teachers being fired. There, there is a problem. There are real concerns. I sat next to somebody the other day who said who said they didn't really think this was a problem. And they were Christian themselves. Yeah. And I said, I don't really know if there's a problem. And I explained to him, I said, you know, 
I, you know, people lose their jobs, which is what you're saying. So I gave him some yeah. examples of that. And literally, as we were sitting next to each other in this conference, my colleague sends an email saying, oh, by the way, we just got kicked off Eventbrite. We can't even advertise our event yeah. because it has a detransition. It was a Chloe Cole event. Yeah. We've had Chloe on this show. Um, and they literally, Eventbrite won't let them put out their event. I'm not saying that's the same as losing a job or that's the same as persecution yeah. abroad of Christians where they're literally holding on to their life. But what I'm saying is we're moving in a bad direction where, where it is okay to you know, come after Christians and not treat them the same. That is how it starts. It's okay to silence them. It's it's okay to threaten. I mean, I don't know if this falls in the Christian category, but Riley Gaines, I yes. mean, the hate directed at her. But yep. anyway, we won't go all the way down that road. But I do want to go on to say that this part gets really fun. Mr. Chelsea then goes on to mention our legal center's involvement in the whole thing. And he goes after you, Victoria. So I know. I always I, love the I attention. I that would be fun for you to respond to. <laughs> He says, quote, Victoria Cobb, president of the Family Foundation, saw an opportunity to flog the issue to claim religious persecution. I'll just let you <laughs> take off on that. OK, so here's the thing. In any left wing thing that happens, they they can talk about it and it's becomes a national story. It becomes the narrative. When we talk about something, we're inappropriately speaking about something because we're just trying to use it to some end. No, we think there's an important point of making, giving voice to these incidences so people start realizing that the threats are increasing, that, that the fear of Christians, the irrational reaction to Christian behavior is getting worse. And if we don't call that out, then we will be far too far down the path to stop the hatred of Christians that yeah. is building in this country. So it's amazing to me that our side can, you know, that we're, we're sort of seen as like, we're just trying to exploit a situation. No, we're trying to amplify a situation yeah. that needs amplification. Yeah, absolutely. We cannot stay silent. If you just shut up and put up with it, you will soon find that multiple people are too afraid to, to pray, to express anything. You know, we've, we've gradually seen the remnants of our Judeo-Christian heritage being eradicated from the public square that monuments that have been there for years, Ten Commandments, statutes. Yep. Um, you know, it, the list goes on and on. At some point, y you need to say something. We want to stand behind the people that are doing that. But, you know, I just got to say, the fact that he took a shot at us, at the Family Foundation, at you, that actually does not bother me because we'll take the hits. I like the attention. It's okay. Which is well, all we need to do is defend the people right. that are brave enough to do this stuff. And yeah, take send the hits our way. Yeah, we will take the hits and defend people like Angela to help them have their religious freedom. So that's fine. But I will tell you what did bother me that I found maddening was this elitist, overconfident assertion that I really felt was the tone of his editorial that came through with his assertion that at the end of the day, you don't have these broad freedoms to express faith in public. It's got to be done silently, silent prayer, or in your home or in church. And he just was asserting that like it's a known fact that every educated person knows this. I felt like it, that had a downing tone. And so I just want to take some of that on. So let's just hear what he said in his own words. I kind of summarized, but here's what he said. Quote, if the government puts its thumb on the scale for one religion over another, it invariably suggests the government favors the former. We can't have that in the United States. We decry such tyranny in theocracies or fundamentalist countries. We all can pray for our school divisions silently, allowed at home, in places of worship. Some rules apply in public forums that indeed seem harsh, the benefits, though, outweigh the drawbacks. So, Victoria, do the benefits of banning public prayer outweigh the drawbacks? All right, well, I have to start with the, for the first part of his statement, which I have to comment on, which the government was not putting its thumb on any religion by letting her say talk about her own religion. So I just have to clarify he's back to, like, n an incorrect uh, explanation of what actually happened. But So, so <laughs> why is that wrong? Why is her prayer not the equivalent? Because of, she's not a government official, right, which we, I think we're very clear yeah. about. She was not a government <laughs> official. So there's no thumb going anywhere on anyone's religion. But more than that, this idea that the benefits outweigh the cons. We, I, anyone can just look around and see that over the past several decades where we have slowly started to push all of our Judeo-Christian heritage out of the public square, 
we're not seeing improvement in the lives of our citizens, right? There are things that faith contributes that are very positive. You know, I think about something as simple as the Ten Commandments because to me, that's the most basic. And honestly, whether or not it came from our faith or some other faith, loving your neighbor is kind of a good thing for most people to believe and grab onto because it's going to mean we're going to treat mm-hmm. each other differently. And so we've been pushing out every aspect of everybody's faith out of Mm -hmm. where they that has so much been a part of our history and I think it set a good tone even if you're not a person of our faith if that makes sense yeah pushing Christians out of the foster care system pushing churches out of being able to provide preschool Christians as you have said numerous times Christians have a history of providing all these social services so to speak and we're pushing that out so that is a that is not beneficial I think that uh, the drawbacks do outweigh you know censoring public expression of faith and you know you brought up the Ten Commandments it does also bring to mind these efforts we're seeing now to remove crosses that memorialize memorialize veterans that have been there for even decades I think that's where this is going and what it looks like is a, and is, maybe not just looks like, a state-enforced form of secularism, yeah. state-enforced secularism, that um, leap puts us on the road to communism. We know what that looks like from history. Yeah. <laughs> the, what is unfortunate is people have lost the perspective, and it's actually outlined very well in a book called Good Faith, have lost the perspective that many of the great things that happened in this country were started by people of faith, the hospitals, the adoption, mm-hmm. all those things. And so the role that people of faith have played in caring for fellow man is significant. The government will never out care for someone else when people of faith are are instructed as part of their religion to be the hands and feet of mm-hmm. Jesus, right? Like the government's never going to do that better. And so the idea that we're going to, you know, completely secularize everything is only going to ultimately end up in less good, less kindness, less overall general good. I, I sat next to somebody who basically said they didn't. They thought the court was pretty strong on religious freedom, so this really wasn't an issue. And there have been good decisions, and you mentioned the veterans. We've had a great U.S. Supreme Court decision on memorials in the Brandenburg case. But my point to them was, should someone have to, let's say they lose their job because of a faith issue, should someone have to litigate? And in the case of, for example, Coach Kennedy, go eight years or whatever it's been to get yeah. all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court before the, the, right, the, the wrong is, is corrected, before yeah. religious freedom. What we need is a better understanding applied by everyone of what it meant when our founders wanted us to exercise our faith. They, uh, there's more understanding in the average person about this idea of separation of church and state, which is not in the Constitution, than there is of this idea of exercising religion and what that's intended to look like. Mm-hmm. And the vision the founding, freed- the founding fathers had for yes. the First Amendment, for our Constitution. It wasn't so we could all hide and pray in our houses. That's not what they risked their lives for. So Correct. Um, they did not come all the way over to this country to hide and be a person of faith in secret. And your point, though, about Coach Kennedy having to fight for eight, nine years for the right to just simply of his own volition go out and pray on the sidelines, you know, after a game. Um, the average person is not going to have the tenacity to fight for eight, nine years uh, Not every Angela is going to have people that will stand up in the audience and say the Lord's Prayer or have the Founding Freedoms Law Center. And that's why it's important that we um, come alongside these people, not only that people like Angela stand up, but but that we do stick our necks out. Amplify their story. We need to tell their story. We need to defend them. And people need to talk about it because if we don't, if we are not constantly making people aware that these things are happening, we will be far too far gone. Right. And there won't be a way to come back as a country. And what makes me sad is this is what makes America special and different, yeah. right? Do we forget that? That we have the freedom of religion. What what does it look like without that? It's, it, you know? It looks like uh, North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> people so, can't, you know, have freedoms. So let's not forget that. But yeah. I, I guess that gives us a good place to wind up here. And so I just want to thank everybody for listening today. Don't forget to share our Speak Up Virginia playlist. And as always, if you can give us a good review on Spotify or Apple, those audio only uh, forums, if you're on there, that helps get the word out to more people. If you can give us that review, that's great. And also, I'll just put in another plug, still time for early voting. Make sure you do that. We need to use our biblical responsibility. We need to exercise not only our constitutional right but to practice biblical stewardship and represent biblical values at the polls. So make sure get out, 
early vote. There is a voter guide available at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. And we'll see you next time. Remember, we are stronger when we speak together. Thank you.